And um, I'm going to turn it over now to someone that I'm going to introduce you all to. One of my friends, amazing woman, Kyra Talese, is a writer from South Los Angeles. Let's hear it for Kyra Talese. She has parlayed her talent for storytelling into a career in television after spending more than a decade in marketing and communications. She first served as writer and co-producer on Black and Sexy TV's 2019 web series, Hello Cupid 3.0, and has gone on to earn credits on Bounce TV series, In the Cut, and Family Time, as well as HBO's A Black Lady Sketch Show and Insecure. Most recently, she was staffed on Universal Peacock's Killing It. Let's hear it for Kyra Talese. Hello, hello, hello. Um, first of all, thank y'all for still hanging with us. We know it's late, and uh, we all appreciate it. I'm sure our filmmakers here appreciate it. Um, so we're just going to get into a little bit of conversation about the films that we saw. Um, and I think, hold on, I got to remember to keep this mic to my mouth, so bear with me. I don't do this often. Um, <laughs> I think I want to start with um, Asha and Afuru, since we saw your film first. We'll start with you guys first. Um, I just want to know, what was your, first of all, when I pressed play to see that for the first time, the very first face that popped up on the screen was familiar to me. So I was immediately intrigued, and I'm just curious to know, what was your um, inspiration behind the film? If you can start there. Um... So originally, I um, wanted to write a web series, and I wanted to write it about a life coach whose arc was to start from kind of um, a little bit more unaware um, and needing of some growth to be able to really help other people, and who ended up in a place where she knew herself more and she's able to do that. And so I wanted to write that series. Um, and my inspiration was pretty much uh, having known a lot of people who, um, who kind of were in that type of a business. And I felt like had the same type of thing going on and that they weren't really completely sure of themselves, but were trying to help other people. And I also can relate to that. So that's I what I was going to ask you. I wanted to write about that. <laughs> yeah, let's be a hunter. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. No, I, I think it's so funny because in the, the culture that we're in now with social media, everybody has a platform, everybody's using their platform. Everyone has the answers for how they can help and improve on everyone else. So you see so much of it, some of it is genuine and some of it is not. And I just thought it was a really interesting take on that um, to kind of have have her get into a more genuine place, but also to kind of explore the parody in that that exists. I thought that was great. Um, for, actually, let's go to Olivia next. Olivia, for you, um, your film, well, actually, tell us a little bit about the film yourself. What was your inspiration behind it? Um, so, like, one of my, like, growing up, my mom was, um, was like, really a part of the LGBTQ+. Plus, and um, I would grow up hearing all these, like, kind of like horror stories about them not being accepted and like being kicked out of the house and just like horrible stories. Like, and so like one of my inspirations was to show something that, show that being like an acceptance, like what kind of, what kind of space would we be in? And I do know people who, um, my Marshall, the guy who is, my lead is actually my friend and he was telling me like, he's actually gay in real life and he was telling me like, so many of his friends love cross, uh, love um, dressing up as a woman and being in that space, but yet they don't know how to come out to their partners. They're like, quote unquote, still in the closet. And so I wanted to make a story about like, being accepted by the person you love and like, even if it's not like in the norm, I love that. Um, it's interesting, too, because because that was going to be my next question to you. I was going to come back down the line, but since you explored it, when it came to casting that, were you, when you wrote the project, did you already have uh, your lead in mind when you, or did you discover him in the process, and how important was it for you to make sure that the person that you cast in that role was also part of that community? Um, actually, I kind of, um, he was like kind of a surprise. We got a lot of people auditioning for this role, and like, he was like, oh, by the way, I sing. And I was like, oh, great, because we didn't have, we didn't know what we were going to do for the music. Um, and so he was, it was really, like, refreshing when he came up. And he was like, and also, like, it wasn't, like, 
Like when he auditioned, he was like, this is who I am. I'm a person. I'm this, I'm that. I can sing. I can do whatever you want to do. And then later on down the road, we actually found out he was actually gay too. So it was an ad it was something that added to the story for me. Um, and like, I feel like it added to the story. Like once we like all got to sit down and be friends and like learn about each other and learn about ex their experiences. Just lended some authenticity mm -hmm. to the role, I'm sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, bringing it back down here to Gerald. So let's talk about Stacks because low key, the music video, I don't know if you guys peeped that this was Gerald starring in that music video at the end. That could have been a whole nother entry into this film festival. Let's just talk about that. But um, I I'm sure we have all can put it together. What was your inspiration for, for Stacks? Um, it was two things. One, um, I saw people treating, our society is becoming so terse in a way. And I physically saw a woman hoarding toilet paper literally less than a week before LA went into lockdown. Mm -hmm. And it just infuriated me. I, I wanted to like rip her Costco card out of her hand and like kick her out. I mean, like I went home, I was livid. Yeah. Because I didn't want to go to jail. <laughs> so I just went home mad and um, thought about it and then said, okay, maybe I can flip it. But then the backdrop of that anger for me was, you know, we saw when they were talking about in the lawyer piece, we saw, you know, he talked about representing, uh, being on the team to represent the Philando Castile family. Mm -hmm. Part of the anger came back from seeing how we've been being treated as minorities, whether it be police shooting down black men and women, whether in their custody, out of their custody, whether it be Ahmaud Arbery can't jog in a the neighborhood. There was that other anger. And I always believe that art creates life. Mm -hmm. And what we see in art, we see reflected in our community. Um, and so when all of this stuff was going on, there was so much uncertainty with the pandemic, I was just like, yo, stereotypes hurt and people don't realize it. So I was so mad because really, and I'm, I apologize to all of you now because I'm sure you're all wonderful people, but literally I was like, this is all your fault. You're hoarding toilet paper, you're stereotyping all of us. So I wrote this whole piece like, yo, I'm going to sucker everybody in that watches it and I'm going to reveal and give them a laugh at the end. But I'm hoping that they'll look in the mirror and go, did I get one more role than I needed? Did I, if I, if I laughed at the reveal of the toilet paper, did I, did I accept or do I have some of that stereotyping in my mind mm -hmm. that I've accepted because of the conditioning? And it was really me angrily telling every single one of you off. <laughs> So first of all, because that reveal, can we just talk about that reveal for a second? Because baby, when I was watching it the first, I'm sitting here and I'm like, what is that? Of course, we all assume drugs, right? Because like you said, we're watching this. And then when they show that freaking, I swear to you, I laughed out loud at that reveal. I thought that was brilliant. I thought it was great. Um, very timely, clearly. Uh, speaking of timely, how many of you um, filmed these projects or produced these projects during quarantine, during COVID, since the COVID era? Everyone? So can we just talk about some of the challenges that that have presented? Um, for anyone who's not a filmmaker, I'm sure that there's a whole set. We can talk about challenges in filmmaking all day long, but specifically as it relates to filming in the time of COVID, uh, let's start down at the other end. Just any challenges that you might have faced, anything that you might have experienced? Well, we were definitely very prepared, you know, um, in the film business. We had really great direction from the unions about what to do, what not to do, how to stay safe. And so um, it was easy in that way to sort of just follow the rules. And um, in the beginning, when we didn't really know much about COVID, um, you know, I think it was easier for people to follow the rules, but I would also say that in the film business, people want to work. And so um, most people follow the rules if they wanted to work. Um, so challenges, it was not bad for us at all. I, don't, I can't remember anything that was really a huge challenge because of that. What about you, Olivia? I know you were in a much smaller, more contained set. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped Asha, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Asha. No. Afru summed it up. <laughs> I saw you passing the mic, so I figured you were giving her carte blanche to answer that for the two of you. My apologies. But Olivia, what about you in your smaller, more contained set? Um, our set was, it was my first set, so I didn't really know what to expect because I'd never had like a pre-COVID set before. Um, 
But I remember like my DP was like really intense and he was like, even during meal breaks, he was like, everyone needs to be six feet apart. Like everyone have your mask on in between bites. He was really intense. And like we had, again, never had pre-COVID set. So I had like my roommate made this big old meal and you just had to like scoop it from the thing and put it on your plate. And he's like, this is against COVID regulations. And I was like, sir, this is my first film. I don't know. So like it was, besides him, it was pretty chill. Like everyone was okay. <laughs> Interesting. And now with COVID being the whole backdrop for your film, um, a little bit of a larger production, still a kind of a contained set. Well, it really was. I mean, I guess there was a total of 12 people on our set. Mm -hmm. So there was, and at the time we, 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 shot this the Wednesday night before LA went into lockdown. There, there, there were no union rules at that point. Got it. Okay. Yeah, there were no guidelines. Okay. Productions were shutting down because they were like... We had a great COVID uh, uh, on set. COVID officer? First, yeah, she was fantastic. Our, our co-producer, Meredith, was fantastic. It's like, I remember getting in the elevator and pushing the button. I was like, why is this elevator wet? <laughs> <laughs> and she was white sauce. Of course. Of course. Lysol and Hilarious. Yeah. So with with there were no guidelines and there was fear and but because of the subject matter, I was like, if we don't shoot this right now, it's not going to happen mm -hmm. because when we if we're, at, if we're down for two weeks or three weeks, remember we didn't know how long it was going to be. When it comes back, everybody's going to get back to work and there's not going to be nobody's going to be available. So the biggest challenge was we had to create our own protocols. Mm -hmm. So we did things like we had individual box lunches and Meredith kind of handled that. And literally we Lysoled everything. And then believe it or not, one of the biggest challenges was getting all that toilet paper when toilet paper was short. Oh, listen, that was next on my list of things to ask. First of all, if you did it during COVID when I could not find toilet paper at any target, how did you get a duffel bag full of it? Okay. <laughs> Working in production <laughs> made that happen. So I actually had maybe about five or six rolls in my house. And then we had shot a movie and we had had a location like we had rented somebody's house and they always make you bring your own toilet paper. So we went to Costco and bought one of those big 12 pack, 50 packs or whatever. And we only used like 10 of them. Mm -hmm. So the rest of it was sitting on the top of a file cabinet at our office. So I was like, and I literally was about to call everybody. I know I was like, can I borrow one roll of toilet paper? You'll have it back on Thursday. I promise. And then I walked in my office and it was like that, that, that God moment. I walked around the corner. It was like, Oh, <laughs> Hottest commodity of 2020, okay? Um, so speaking of timeliness, because, you know, it's kind of surprising to me to learn how early during the quarantine process you shot that. Now, for me, also a screenwriter, it can take me three years to write 30 pages. It doesn't, but let's just, for the sake of argument. How long did it take you to come up with that script? How, I mean, from the time that you sat down to the time that you were in production, what was that time? All right, like? It was a miracle because I'm writing other stuff that, yeah, it could take me three months to write two pages, sure. right? So... Um, I left Costco at like five o'clock all pissed off. I stewed on it all day. I called him at like 11 o'clock at night and I was about to go to bed. And he's like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I might write this little thing. I got this idea. He's like, oh yeah, you should write it. I was like, all right, whatever. And I laid down and went to sleep. I started to go to sleep. And as soon as I got comfortable, something in my head said, stop being lazy and write this thing. It'll be quick and easy. It probably took me an hour and a half to write it. Wow. If that. And then I went to sleep. I woke up the next morning, sent it to him, and I got to give him and my DP, uh, Thomas Hennessy, a ton of credit because he read it, called me back Sunday morning and said, when are we shooting? And then the DP said, when are we shooting? And then I was like, crap, I don't have no excuses. They're ready to do this thing. <laughs> and then pulled the trigger. Now we got to go with it. So yeah, like literally that night. But it was, here's the thing. Like, I don't know how, you know, your process, but for me, I was so upset and so on fire. And then when I came up with a way to channel that, it was like, okay. And I went through and did a bunch of revisions, but at the end of the day, like, it really poured out of me because I was so on fire about it. And as a director, you know, I pr I've produced formulaic shows, movies for a lifetime and sci-fi. And, and I don't disrespect that. That's part of my job, part of my history, and I will do that again. But as a director, I'm kind of like, if I'm not on fire about the subject matter or the topic or the message, I don't want to touch it. Yeah. Yeah. It's too hard, I and I'm terrible. I feel like I'm terrible at writing when I'm writing. Oh, that <laughs> imposter syndrome settles in. Even, I mean, I don't know if it ever ends. Everyone that I've talked to at every single level says they sit down. I'm not going to say everybody. 90% of everyone that I've talked to sits down and we struggle with, can I really do this? Why did I think I could do this? Why I feel I bad this talking one? about it. I'm like tortured right now. <laughs> 
<laughs> now, for Asha, let's hear about your uh, your process. Um, this was not your first short film, correct? You've done others? Yes. And so with this one, how long did it take you to come up with this concept from the time that you sat down to start writing to the time that you wrote, you know, it in? How, what was that like for you? Um, well, I had the idea just like driving around with my friend. I was like, I really want to do a comedy and I really want to do it about life coaches. I think it's so interesting. I want to write something. And then um, at the beginning of COVID or uh, sometime in 2020, I was just like, okay, let me just go ahead and do the script. Just get it out the way. It's going to be it's going to be quick. It's short. Let me just get out the way. And I and I I don't know how long it took me, but I know I was finished in like a day or something. And I was like, this is exactly what I'm looking for. We're good. Um, and and then yeah. from the time that you knew that the script was as let's call it first draft final or fi ready to start talking production final from that point to going into production. What was that timeline like? Um, like how, like, did I do revisions and stuff? No, no, just oh. from the point that your script was ready to be produced uh -huh. to actually starting production. I didn't look at it until the next following year. I was like, I've done it. And, and I didn't do any <laughs> revisions or anything. And then when it came time for production, I was like, okay, let me just tighten it up. Let me make sure it's good. Got it, got it, got it. Um, yeah. yeah. Sometimes you have to step oh. away from it, right? It's like you get too in the weeds of it. Right. It's paralyzing. But I just want to add that she she put together a writer's room. It was her first writer's room. So there were three other writers for, what, seven other episodes that you guys wrote? Um, and so we thought, oh, we would shoot a few different episodes, but we, but we just ended up shooting that first episode. I don't know what the time period was between the time that you would... Um, okay. Um, so there's a whole series written, which is really great. Um, and, and we want to make the entire short series, so we're, we're working on that. But um, but I thought it was great that during COVID that you, you put together this writer's room of young writers uh, to write the entire series. Absolutely. So, okay, that, that's news, too. Where did you source these writers from? Were these people in your network? Did you do out, like, an open call? Are these people who have been screenwriters before, or was this their first opportunity? Yeah, they're, uh, um, they're screenwriters, um, just like me, kind of like trying to, to, be, to be professional screenwriters. Trying, and you're doing friends. it. You're doing it. <laughs> we got to speak those things that aren't as though they are, okay? You are doing it. You've done it. Yeah. Uh, but they were my friends. We met each other on set or we met each other on different production jobs, um, and they wanted to work. And I was like, I want to work too. <laughs> so, so let's do it. Let's put together a room. I yeah. love that. How long did your writer's room last? Um, it was the, the summer of 2020, so it was like May through August. Wow, and you wrote seven episodes. Can I just say that I've been in an independent room that started in June, and literally I had to walk away from it a couple weeks ago, and we were on a rewrite of episode one. So give yourself <laughs> a big <laughs> hand of applause for getting seven, eight episodes written over the summer of 2020 when no one was in their right mind. Okay. <laughs> we got to give ourselves, give, give yourself some flowers. How about that? Thank you. <laughs> um, I was also going to ask, because I mentioned that the moment I pressed play, the first uh, face on screen was familiar to me, uh, Dana Dooley, and I went to high school together, honestly, and then I met, ran into her again on the set of Insecure, so it was just, you know, it's been wild. How did, did you guys know Dana? Was she just cast? How, what was that? Uh... She was supposed to be here tonight, too, by the way. Okay. But um, uh, I have known Dana for a while, um, for a long time, through Friends. And I, I think she's hilarious. She's and, hilarious. Yes. <laughs> and um, I used to always tell her, I want to work with you someday. And when Asha came up with this concept and, and I read the script, I was like, oh, my God, Dana would be so great for it. Um, and so, yeah, that's how we got her on board. And she's on board for the series if we do it independently, especially, you know, so um, we'll see. But, yeah. I love that. I love that. Now, back down here about casting, since we have our uh, star up here, how did, you, well, first for you, <laughs> uh, talk to me a little bit about your casting process. And I mean, you you are somewhat of an industry vet, so I'm sure you had a whole repertoire to dip into to pull some people out of. <sighs> One of the things you said is like, your tribe will sustain you, mm -hmm. right? So um, the amazing story about Mark is um, when I first moved to LA in 2006, I got here, I had like a big career as a DJ, I had been pretty successful. And I got here and I thought, oh yeah, I'll get right in because I got this DJ thing. And like most people to get here, nobody cared. <laughs> like, nobody cared. And I almost like well, three months in, I felt like I was like depressed. 
because nothing was happening with my career. And um, I said, okay, I realized you got to humble yourself. You got to start like you know nothing and start at the beginning. So I called a, a friend, I, I called a bunch of my friends and just said, listen, I'm new here. I don't know a lot of what's going on. Do you know anybody that's successful in the industry that will take a five minute phone call for me so I can just ask them some basic questions? And our, our mutual friend, uh, Eugene said, call Mark, Mark will take your call. And I called Mark. And I look back, I probably ask him the most basic of basic questions like, how do I get a job? Or like <laughs> something silly, he, he can comment on it. And Mark just was like, hey, listen, you know, here's some places I suggest you might look at to study at, but stay busy, get a job, get in a class. And then that was our first conversation. And then later on, we ended up talking and we became friends. And his kindness is what opened the door for many years later, me to be able to say, hey, let me let me hire you on a job for this move, this network or that network. But ultimately, I was like, hey, man, I'm doing this thing. Do you want to do it? He was like, I told you it wouldn't it wouldn't have happened if he didn't Saturday, Sunday morning say, when are we shooting? Not, oh, that's good. Let's maybe do it down the road. Like when? Like, like we're, we're already committed. It's just a matter of what the give me a call time. Um, so for my casting process, everybody I had worked with before, I just thought that they embodied these roles. I didn't necessarily write to them generally, but they embodied these roles and I just made phone calls. Um, Eddie Steeples, who played Crab Man on My Name Was Earl, was supposed to be in the piece as well. Literally the morning we were shooting, he's like, yo, I got a little bit of a cold. And I was like, yeah, bro, I got to protect the set and the cast. <laughs> You're uh, fired, hired, fired. fired. Grand and it was grand corona. we didn't know what corona was then, right? We, it was like this crazy thing. So I was like, stay home. Fortunately, he didn't have coronavirus. He was fine. And he still supports the film. It's been great. But for me, it was really my, my tribe sustained me on this. And my experience let me meet that tribe. But really, hats off to all of them because everybody I called was like, yeah, we're a little scared about this coronavirus thing too, but I know you're a professional, so we'll figure it out. And they all showed up, and we fortunately we were able to get in and knock it out in about a nine-hour session and, and be done. Wow. Wow. Um, uh, Mark, for you, I mean, obviously you guys have a friendship and a relationship that goes back a while, but what, what, is it, what was it about this script that just res... I mean, because you played your part so well and so seriously and so stone face. <laughs> um, just tell me a little bit about what your thoughts were going into the role. Well, first of all, I, I never get those roles, you know, to play the bad guy. Sure. I'm always, you know, the black guy on the white show who's happy and fun, funny. And, and so uh, when Gerald said, well, you know, what's his name can't do it, so you should play Hector. And I was like, yeah, great, because I want a dark role. Mm. And I think the thing that, that spoke to me most is one, it was dark, and then two, the twist is undeniably huge. Oh my God, huge. so good. It's, it's I, I, everybody who I know who's seen it um, laugh out loud. And f for me, that was great. It's like, because yeah. now I have the best of both worlds. I always think that I'm a better dramatic actor than I am a comedic actor. Because mm -hmm. I work harder at it. You know, funny comes easy for me. Mm -hmm. And um, so now I get to do both things in the same project. Thanks to Gerald. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, oh, hold on, I just lost it. Give me a second, guys. I told you I don't do this often. I want to talk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I want to talk a little bit about what goes into getting these shorts made. So as a person who is a screenwriter, I've never, I've worked on other people's sets, obviously. I've, you know, collaborated with friends who've done projects where I had a role in production, but I've never produced a film myself or, or even a short film. So what does that look like? I mean, sitting down, I get overwhelmed just by the thought of where do I start? How much is it going to cost? Where do I find this money? So we have three different films here. Just tell me a little bit, whoever wants to jump in, about what goes into sitting down and bringing your vision to life cost, resources, you know, like you said, digging into your tribe and just figuring out how to make these things happen. Whoever wants to start. Some, can I just say something real quick? Sure. So if it was my mother and she is... First of all, I thought that was your sister. <laughs> so let's applaud for Afuru for that reason. Get out of here. Okay. Come on, mom. <laughs> um, and she's like, uh, rumple still skin. Mm -hmm. Like she spins gold from straw. Like she I got the reference. You took that <laughs> a second, but I got it. <laughs> but the way that uh for both of the I've I've done two short films and each time I remember freaking out 
both times, just all the way up until just like, I don't know how we're going to get this done. This one, it was COVID and money and all kinds of stuff. And I was like, I have no idea how we're going to do this. And she's calm, cool, and collected, takes a step by step, also keeps me out of the process so I don't have to freak out too, too much and, and gets, gets it done. But if you want to say how. Well, I just know that um, just like Ger Gerald, Ger Ger Gerald said, um, you know, you had someone who said, when are we going to get this done? And so for, for me, I know just in terms of my experience that you, you do freak out, but you also just have to take a step and take a step and just have the, the, the goal in mind of what needs to be done and have the courage to just move through, even if you don't see the end, even if you don't know where all the money is coming from, even if you don't know like who's in the cat, cast or whatever. But um, for me, I think it's just, I don't know. I guess I'm Rumpelstiltskin or something. I don't know. <laughs> I just keep it moving. I love that. And I love that as a, I'm also a mom with an adult daughter. And just the fact that you're pouring into your baby that way and helping her make her dreams a reality. Girl, I salute you. I love that. I love that for both of you. Um, Olivia, first time film. First, was it is your first short film, but you typically work in another genre. What was this uh, process like for you? How did you start? Where, how did you know where to start? Um... So, um, this is my first time, like, doing anything film-based. I come from, like, nobody who's done in film. It was a bad idea from both parents to come out here and pursue film. So, like, I genuinely had no one supporting me, like, nobody. So, it was just, like, but I'm a very stubborn person. Like, I'm always down to do whatever I want to do. I've always been like that. So, it was kind of like, well, you guys all said no, so I'm going to do it anyways. And so, I kind of hit up one friend and she was she was, my, she was actually my producer for this and I was like, hey, I know that we don't really like, we've met like five times, but like, can you potentially read my script and like, let's see where it goes. And she loved the script. She actually like told me like a bit further down the line, she was like, yeah, by the way, if your script was bad, I was gonna be like, oh, I'm busy that week. I'm so sorry. <laughs> So it was like a really refreshing like moment to you know hear that, um, and so it felt like it was just us two. And then for the longest time, it was just us two trying to put it together, find locations. Luckily, like luckily or unluckily, like I got an unemployment, so I had like a pretty good chunk of money. And I was like, well, what do I do with it? So th that's one of the reasons I made this short film. Um, but then I like one of my best friends, she helped out on it. And then everything kind of just like, I always like to say like by the grace of God, because genuinely all of like the heavens opened, the planets aligned, like no one canceled. Um, locations just kind of magically fell out of nowhere. Um, like the club location, actually, the guy was like, yeah, we haven't had business all year. And like literally we shot that location for $300. Wow. So... Yeah, yeah, by the grace of God is how that film got made. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. And then, Gerald, for you. Um... Uh, by the grace of God, I think all films get made. Like, it's, it's use independent ones, at least. Like, um, uh, it was, you know, I was fortunate in that um, kind of the theme with, with your mother helping you. And I, I think we as artists have to do so many things by ourselves with no support sometimes if even if it feels like there's no support that there's no at a boy not and there's no nothing forcing you to do your job every day right yep. that that if it if one person says okay when are we doing it that can sustain you mm -hmm. and then when you're ready to quit that person can be like it ain't time to quit and then when they want to quit you can be like hey you told me not to quit so now you can't mm -hmm. quit either mm -hmm. so um i i, I kind of feel like um for me a lot of the, believe it or not, the, the, the cost up front wasn't too bad for me. We used my office. I got permission to use our parking garage. Um, my DP brought his grip package. I, I, own a F, I own two FS7s, so we used our camera. Like, so there's a, we had some, some advantages from that standpoint. Where we got into some money was in post, um, getting it done and making it really look professional. Uh, we got into some money. And one of the things I'm sure you, got, like, you guys know, film festivals add up. 
a little fifty dollars here and thirty five dollars here and a hundred dollars for this one, and then they're like, "Oh, you're in. Are you and your guys coming?" And then it's like, "Oh, we got it." Like that, we spent as much. I spent more money on film festivals and kind of trying to get it out there and really let it be represented than we spent probably up front on production. Wow. Um, so that's something for anybody who wants to make films. Just be aware that if you really want your film, to, there's a ton of fil free film festivals and low cost ones, but the life of a film isn't a f for, for at least my experience has been the life of it isn't three months or six months in festivals and all of a sudden you get into Sundance and it's easy. The life is you might be promoting your film and getting it into festivals and as much as you can traveling to support it, all spending money during that um, to get your DCP drive, whatever. And that may be a two year cycle. It may be, it may be longer. And with coronavirus, I think that cycle got stretched out even right. longer. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Um, uh, there was a there was a gentleman that that owned the building that I used to live in in Venice, and uh, me and my roommate we produced a lot of plays. Okay. And he always helped us out, no matter what it was. And uh, one thing that that he said to us years ago was that um, you guys are looking at this thing in its totality, and it's overwhelming. He said, look at one piece at a time. Do this piece, then do the next piece, then do the next piece, then do the next piece, so you don't get overwhelmed with it things will fall into place. And every time we produce something, that's the way it happened. Things fell into place as we started going. Okay. So don't get overwhelmed if you're a filmmaker. Don't get overwhelmed. Just do one little thing at a time and move forward. Don't get overwhelmed by it. Let me tell you, I'm taking notes because I get overwhelmed by it. And, and here's the thing. <laughs> we all know. I know you guys. You're going to be like, all right, we're ready to go. And then something's going to come up and you're going to be like, how the heck are we going to do that? How the heck are we going to pay for that? And then you'll figure it out. And then the next thing will come up and you'll be like, oh my goodness, we didn't think about this. Like, part of being a producer, even a director and how you shoot sometimes, is being, a, you got to fix the problem of the day. Mm -hmm. How do you fix this problem and get your day in? Sure. So it's, it's that's just part of the game. So you got to love it. Awesome. Awesome. Yes, absolutely. I think key crew is really important too. Um, I learned that the, that first AD, for me anyway, um, he, he, he's the, in our situation, it was a guy, Karim, you know, he just keeps it, keeps us on schedule. And so it's, um, it helps us to make our day, as you were saying, it helps us to be able to cram what we need to do into a couple days and keep it organized. But I mean, their key crew and that first AD is super important in, in my viewpoint. Yeah, absolutely. It goes back to. So we and, didn't have a first AD because we were so tight. And I was going to ask that. So that was actually going to be my next question is like when it comes to being on set, especially smaller sets, independent, a lot of times you have to wear multiple hats, right? You're switching hats on and off all day. So for me, again, having worked on other projects, not my own, um, I that is enough to make my head spin. How do you manage that? You know, how do you, when you're a writer and you're on set and you're finding the need to maybe tweak the script on set and, you know, things are changing, how do you manage to sort of flipping out of those different hats and into the role as needed? I, for me, you know, I did a bunch of stuff on this, but specifically when we were shooting, I was basically like semi-props, <laughs> props, first AD director. Uh, one of the things that happened is like um, Meredith Thomas, who is here, is a friend of mine. I was like, hey, I need help. And she came on and I was like, anything that's not on camera on the day we shoot, like I need you to handle like, all the all the production stuff like make sure lunch is here and make sure that we're following COVID stuff and right. anything else that comes up i think we needed something we couldn't find and and she, you know make sure this person's out you know ready and prepared you know makeup wardrobe you know I'll, I'll give an approval on a photo but you you have to have help like that but i think in that situation i knew what i needed to get and collaboration being open to collaboration for me will save your day. Like my DP is really smart. He shot a lot more than I have. So I can be like, hey, Thomas, this is kind of what I'm thinking and what I want. And here's how I picture it. And then he goes, well, yeah, we can get that, but let's get this first. And he can help keep us moving he, because I didn't have a first AD, which the first AD would help with that too a little bit. But we just didn't because I was trying to hire one and we, we crewed this up we literally crewed this whole thing up in about 62 hours and sh started shooting. So 62 hours. Uh. And it was COVID. So people were like, yeah, I'm not doing it. Sure. So, and I was literally down to the day going, calling everybody I knew trying to get one or two more crew members that we just ultimately couldn't get. Mm -hmm. But I think my thing is how do you manage it? Love what you're doing. 
because if you don't, you you won't sustain it. Yeah. So if I was working on like a movie for Lifetime or sci-fi and they're like, yeah, we want you to be semi-props and first AD and director and it, I'm like, um, is my check $300,000? Because if it's not, I'm not doing all those jobs. <laughs> like, yeah. it, it just wouldn't sustain me. But because it was something that I loved, I was like, and my friends were able to kick in and do a little bit extra that they might not always do. Like Mark, that was Mark's car in the, his SUV in the, in the piece. The one, I rented the, the one car, but the, you know, his car was in there. So there were all these little things that people did that nobody had to do. But that's again, when we go back to tribe and we go back to the love for what you do. Absolutely. And you know, when you love it and you have a good tribe, you treat each other appropriately. And you know, like that movie's, I'm so proud of that movie. Yeah, that movie's be. not me. Mm -hmm. That movie's the tribe. Mm -hmm. Like, like I get a lot of credit for it. I'm the guy up front a lot, but like my DP was a rock star. Meredith was a rock star. Like, especially with the festivals and everything after the fact. Mark was a rock star. Like in my my post house, the ed the editors won an Emmy. Like, did me a favor. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So everybody was rock stars, and like that's the tribe. That's not me. Sure, sure. I love that. Did, did anyone else have? Um, so I will say, like, I like I, I was writer, director, producer, and I remember I was like walking down. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to like the fashion district. You know, when they like the back alley, it's like a bunch of people. And I remember it was like me, uh, my best friend who helped me on the film, and my. Um, my first CD, but she's an actor, so she was just, I just gave her that title. So we're all like shopping for props, we're looking around, and it was just, I personally hate shopping. And so I remember I just stopped in the middle of this alley, people were walking past me, my best friend and my friend walked ahead and I was just like, I am not a producer, I cannot do this, this is not my job, I don't wanna do this. And they turned around, they're like, pretty much like, you gotta, like you wanna make this film, like you have to do this. like. This is a passion pro passion project. You have to do this. And like, for me, wearing those hats, it was hard, especially the producer hat, because everyone's looking to you to produce. Like, where are the props? Where are the snacks? Where the, where is this? Where is this? Where is that? And the only way I was able to keep changing hats was because of my two friends. So it was definitely like a clarifying moment. And I always have these things where I'm like, I'm never doing this again. I'm never doing this again. And I am currently doing it again. Like I'm, <laughs> I am producing another short film and we actually shot at the beach. This is another, I'm never doing it again. Because if you have ever like edited beach scene, you would know not to shoot at the beach. The beach presents <laughs> so many issues from wind it, uh, to sound to waves. To yeah. People. It's just mm -hmm. a lot. We, um, yeah, it was, Sorry, go ahead. No, it's okay. It's okay. So we're almost out of time. I do want to ask everyone a couple more questions really quickly. These are fun ones. The first is, you get a budget to make your dream film. Who are you casting? Who's directing? Let's start with you, Asha. <laughs> who are you, who, who, who's your dream director to work with and top two actors? Oh. <laughs> okay, so I know my dream film, what I would want to direct okay. would be an adaptation of Song of Solomon. That's my favorite book. I love that book. Okay. Toni Morrison, that would be the film that I would want to do. Okay. <laughs> it's like a drum roll, right? Uh, now look, I'm not gonna, I won't put you on the okay, spot, okay. but what I will say is, okay. if you know that that's the thing that you want to do, baby, you better start thinking about who you're gonna cast, because God will give you what you ask for, okay? So if you know that's what you want to do and that's what you're working on for, you start thinking that all the way through, have a plan, put it on your vision board. And what about you, Olivia? Um, so, like I, in my bio, I'm primarily sci-fi. Like, I love sci-fi to the core of me. Um, he, my favorite director is Guillermo del Toro. He doesn't, he's not specifically sci-fi, but he does sci-fi fantasy, and it just has my heart. If I, I'm not a, like a fangirler, but like I swear, if I ever met this man, I'd be like, please just like adopt me as your like writer, sci-fi baby child. Like I will do anything. <laughs> Um, so he's definitely like my go-to person. Sure. Um, as far as like actors, um, oh, man, every time I cannot remember his name. Um, he's a Puerto Rican, um, man, he was just in, he was just in, uh, Mandalorian. He was a bad guy. Yeah, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I think actually I think that was him. Yeah, okay. he's been in like all the Spike Lee's early films. Yes. God, I'm so in love with that man. The way he acts, he's so him. And I don't really care who the girl is. Like, <laughs> just him. Whoever, just yeah. put him up there with him. Sure. I'm Dreamcast right there. <laughs> and what about you, Daryl? Giancarlo's like the undiscovered. Like everybody knows him, but he's like the greatest. That's not called the greatest. Sure. Like he's up there with the best of the best, bar none. And he doesn't get like that next level that I think he deserves. Sure. Um, uh, be, you, know, you said you're not going to do it again and then like you're doing it again like I'm going to torture myself so it's something that I'm writing um, it's a period piece 1800s has to do with African American rights my actors would be uh, the antagonist would be Paul Giamatti Okay. the protagonist would be uh, Donald Glover Hello. and Mark Christopher Lawrence is in it um, I never know what role I want for you and it's what I want to hopefully be my directorial debut, I love like those. feature. I love that. So that also kind of sums up the next question was going to be what's next? And we know that that's one of the things that's coming next, right? At some point um, it's coming. Well, the way I write and the two pages and like, yeah, we it might take a while. Yeah, yeah. But I do want to do years. another short. Um, uh, I just, I'm trying to figure out exactly what it is because I'm, again, what I said earlier is like, if I don't love it, I'm not touching it. Sure. Um, especially on a short, I have to love it. So I'm really ready to do something but I'm not gonna pull the trigger until I really have what it is. And I usually once I get on it, it goes quickly, mm -hmm. but I'm really trying to pin it down at the moment. Okay, and, and for you, Mark, what's next for you? What do you have coming? Uh, well, I just finished a Christmas movie called uh, Lying Together. Okay. And uh, next month, or when month are we in? We're in March, March. almost April. In May, I'll, I'll do a series uh, for Pure Flicks called Fragment. It's okay. sort of a post-rapture uh, movie. Okay, Yeah. awesome. And I left behind. <laughs> <laughs> and Olivia? Um, I'm currently still shooting like my second short film. It's called The Passing. It's a sci-fi short. It's about basically like near future where overpopulation is a thing. So the government has a mandate that anyone over 50 has to be entered into this lottery. And the people who win the lottery has to commit suicide. So that is the short I'm shooting right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's it's kind of intense, but like you know, it's sci-fi. Sci-fi is intense, so that's what I'm doing now. Okay, and for Asha and Afuru, what's next for you two? Um, well, I'm still wanted to shoot the rest of the series for Looking for Me. Um, and then also, um, I'm wanting to get into commercial work, and so I'm going to be starting a training program for commercial well, ad agency artists. Um, artists trying to get into the advertising industry. Jesus. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I um, also have a distribution company, so I am, I am um, looking for finished content. Um, both series and, and features. Um, I do some shorts, I do some web series. I do have a library. I've got probably over 50 titles that I distribute. Um, I also do produce, so I'm always, um, I'm in development on a couple things now. And um, so if anybody knows anybody who has content they wanna get out for AVOD or for different distribution outlets, please let me know. I'd love to, to, to see that content. But there's so much out there that's just sort of sitting or people don't know that they can earn some money from. Sure. So um, I, I formed the company specifically to be able to offer those opportunities um, for filmmakers of color, women filmmakers, the LGBTQ community as well. And so um, that's what I'm up to. Awesome. Well, guys, this has been a great conversation. Let's thank our filmmakers for their art. Let's thank our audience for hanging with us so late this evening. Um, and we just want to, you know, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you for sharing your art with us. Uh, I'm a, I'll, <laughs> thank you, thank you.